Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 28, 2015, and my guest is Rachel Loudon, visiting scholar in the Teresa Lozano Long Institute of Latin American Studies at the University of Texas and author of Cuisine and Empire, Cooking in World History. Rachel, welcome to Econ Talk. I'm delighted to be here. We're going to talk about your book as well as an essay you've written on food and modernity. Your book's a rather extraordinary history of food, its interaction with empire, nations, and culture, and there's a lot to talk about there. I want to start with grain, um, wheat in particular, but other grains as well. Why are grains so important in the history of food, and why do they remain important? Well, let's go back to the Paleolithic. Uh, human beings, um, it's pretty clear, were incredibly careful and intelligent about inventorying, inventorying the world's food uh, sources. Um, they knew what was edible and what was not. They'd experimented and found out what was poisonous and what was not. And the trick was to find something that was nutritious that was storable, uh, that was transportable. And most foodstuffs just don't live up to this. Uh, most foodstuffs are available only episodically um, in the summer, in the harvest season, or if they're big game, they're only available when you've got a big catch. The really neat thing about grains is that they satisfy all those criteria. They're highly nutritious because they're food for young plants. They are highly storable because they are hard and dry and uh, they don't rot and go bad. And they're highly transportable because they have a high food value to weight ratio. Unlike, say, potatoes, which are very wet and heavy and therefore are hard to store and transport. So you have these little things that are potentially very, very useful year-round human food. The downside of them is that they are absolutely the worst uh, foodstuffs or raw materials in the world to turn into something that we can put into our mouths. Um, yeah, that was one of the most fascinating parts of the book is <laughs> the, the length you have to go to. We think, oh, oh bread comes from wheat. Isn't that nice? <laughs> but it's a little more complicated. Absolutely. Uh, it was brought home to me when my father, who was a farmer and who grew um, hundreds of acres of wheat, decided it would be interesting to make bread out of his own wheat. And in those days, you couldn't just Google and find out how to do it. So he set about taking these grains of wheat and he beat them in a pestle and mortar and he ground them through a meat grinder and he hit them on the stone floor of the kitchen and all he got was squash grains. And uh, As opposed you to have flour. to use a shearing action. I learned that many years later when I moved to Mexico where people still grind grains. And you have to use a lot of weight with both a vertical and a horizontal force to break up the outside husk and get into the flour in the middle. And that's after you've cleaned them and washed them and threshed them and done all the preliminary processes. That's just to turn them into to flour. It's an amazing thing that someone thought to do that rather than just – I mean I assume it's in the beginning. People just chewed it and it wasn't very good, <laughs> very appealing. I, I think if they just chewed it, I mean really the grains pass through you. They're covered with a little hard skin on the outside and you can't get much nutrition from them unless you break them up. 
and we have speculations about whether or not they were made into popcorn by just simply eating or popped wheat, uh, puffed wheat, whether they were sprouted and made into beer, whether they were ground, whether they were boiled. You have to do one of those things. My, um, it, it's a really cute debate. Did humans start agriculture in order to have beer because they wanted beer so much? But I think that misunderstands the extent to which people were experimenting. I think long before agriculture, by about 20,000 BC, humans are experimenting with grains. And I think they did absolutely everything to them. They treated them, they heated them, they, gr they ground them, they treated them with lye, they popped them, they um, probably treated them with acid, they sprouted them, anything to be able to get access to that nutrition. And one thing I want to mention in passing uh, it, that, that runs through the very earliest part of your book is, is the power of that kind of transformative process, in particular cooking. And I, I think modern people tend to think of cooking as it makes food taste better. We have a modest experience with raw foods. We eat sushi. We might have steak tatar. We eat raw vegetables get, uh, with dip at, at cocktail parties. But you point out that the really important part of cooking is it saves time in uh, chewing. Could you explain that? Because that's remarkable. Uh, both chewing and digesting. I mean uh, – uh Animals, if you think of the standard picture of a cow, they first of all uh, spend a lot of time uh, wandering around uh, chewing uh, grass, which is tough, and then they have stomachs and they spend much of the day uh, digesting this food. It takes a huge amount of energy to digest food. So that when you cook, what you're essentially doing is outsourcing digesting in uh, chewing and digesting into the kitchen and doing it previously. And that saves a lot of energy for the humans who are lucky enough to eat the cooked food. Of course, the energy has to come from somewhere, and part of it is from uh, the thermal energy of the fire, but part of it is from the energy of the people or animals or later on wind or water or steam that are doing the hard work of grinding. And just to stick with uh, basics for a minute, the uh, at one point, quite surprising to me, quite late in the book, you mentioned the potato – I think of the potato as a very basic food stuff, but uh, you point out that the potato is a relatively late invention. Talk about its cultural significance and uh, a little bit about its history. Well, the potato is one of a series of roots, which are the roots in a culinary sense. That is um, uh, underground uh, bits of plants that can be cooked into edible food. Um, they uh, have n the roots have always been of less interest to civilized societies because they're so wet and heavy. You cannot provision st uh, cities with roots. Now, the one exception or partial exception to this is the uh, high Andes mountains where they did grow potatoes and use them from early on, but they developed an incredibly elaborate way of freeze-drying them to make them light enough and storable enough to go into cities as well as combining them with maize, which by then was down there. So when the potato comes into Europe... Um, it's um, it's an enormous cultural effort to integrate the potato into the European food system because for anyone who lives in a settled society with cities, root eating is a sign of uh, basically being more like animals. Roots were animal food in Europe. And so basically uh, the poor of Europe had to be bludgeoned into adopting the potato in the uh, 17th and 18th century. Which is a little, it's, it's a little hard to understand because I really love French fries and it's hard to oh, imagine <laughs> how someone could resist this. But they didn't have French fries. Talk, talk about what they had. 
Uh, well, basically, I mean, fat is very expensive for most people. So uh, French fries until the 1960s, 1970s, well, they weren't invented until the middle of the 19th century, late 19th century. But until the, the invention of uh, frozen uh, French fries in the 60s and 70s, um, French fries were for the elite. They were, I mean, only the richest people could afford the potatoes that were cooked in that much fat and double cooked in that fat, which is what you have to do for uh, French fries. What you find in the 19th century as fats become more available for a large bulk of the population is that potatoes become more acceptable because you can put butter on your boiled potatoes, you can layer um, potatoes with milk and cheese and make a gratin, you can bake them and add butter. And that fat makes them much, much more palatable. But the point you make is that in the book is that the potato that uh, was was first introduced, I think, in the eighteenth, early eighteenth century, right. was bitter, um, and nothing like uh, the Idaho baker that baked potato that we might no. envision at a potato bar. No, I've been concentrating and talking to you on the cooking and processing side, but there was also this agricultural trick. They had to pay off, uh, uh, pull off to turn a plant that lived at eight, ten thousand 10,000 feet in the Andes, where seasons are re reversed from northern Europe, into a plant that would grow successfully and be uh, palatable in uh, Europe and the United States, and that took a hundred plus years. And that's true of, of a lot of the things that, that we eat, I assume. I assume that if we went back to the 15, 16, 1700s and looked at what they called a blank, whatever blank is, we would find it almost unrecognizable and very unattractive. Is that is that fair or is that – am I being uh, too harsh? Um, yes. I mean uh, very few – Fruits. Uh, there are a few dates, grapes are palatable and sweet um, without breeding, but most fruits have been um, systematically bred over the centuries. Um, animals have been uh, bred. Probably the only things that we regularly eat that taste as they would have done hundreds of years ago are, are fish of various kinds, but everything else is is the result of human breeding. Yeah, the fruit, the goal has been to make the fruit more like an M&M, and it's working it evidently, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <laughs> um, now, you make a distinction between uh, different kinds of cuisine. Obviously, it's a rough distinction, but you talk about high cuisine, humble cuisine, and middling cuisine. W what do you have in mind with them, and how have they evolved over time? I think this is an absolutely crucial point, and it's one that we forget because we all eat so well nowadays. For, for from really the adoption of the grains, um, beginning around 20,000 BC and long before you get agriculture and then increasing with agriculture, um, one small group of people has been able to get hold of this storable wealth, the grains. And they, uh, the uh, philosophers and physicians who served that group developed a physiological theory that uh, according to each rank of living being, there was an appropriate kind of cuisine. And this was a very comprehensive theory because at that stage, the whole world was thought to be living from minerals up to uh, the spirits or the gods. The spirits or the gods could live on aromas. Minerals just lived on water and stayed static. But if you go to the humans in the middle, the idea was that basically – it's more complicated than this – but basically there were two kinds of humans. There were the – aristocrats, the rulers, the nobilities who had delicate stomachs and had to have highly cooked, highly refined food, the best whitest bread or rice, um, the sauces and sweets and meats and alcohols that 
uh, characteristic of a high cuisine. And then the rest of the people, this would be nine out of every ten people, um, had coarse, rough stomachs. Um, they were closer to the animals, and they could get by on dark breads, root vegetables. Um, they did not need these uh, fine sauces and sweets, and that um, this was a uh, mark of hierarchy that uh, didn't really begin to disappear until after the French Revolution. Yeah, we forget that in our time, uh, food is a form of, for most Americans, it's a form of recreation. It's almost a form of, uh, it's an art form. It's a mix of art, sports, um, physical desire, but most of human history, that's not the case. <laughs> Absolutely not the case. The main aim of nine out of ten of the population, and there are folk sayings in every society that attest to this, was what matters most is a full stomach. Of course, for the aristocrats, yes, um, food was an art form. And when I talk about middling cuisine, I talk about what's happened in the last hundred years where Essentially, in the richer countries, with a few exceptions of unfortunate people who've kind of slipped um, into extreme poverty, everybody can eat the food of the aristocrats of the past. So everybody can eat high cuisine, except that now the difference, the, the sort of striking difference between um, the culinary philosophy of high cuisine in the past and of middling cuisine today is that in high cuisine, you had this physiological theory that the uh, upper classes were physiologically different from everybody else. Nowadays, we all eat uh, a middling cuisine and we have a physiological theory that says essentially all, you know, all human beings can eat the same food so that the USDA, for example, can put out a food pyramid that is supposed to apply to the entire American population. And that's middling and that's something that is radically new in human history. Of course, we don't all agree on what that pyramid should look like, and no. we're in an incredible time, I think, of trying to figure out what's good for us versus what tastes good and what's healthy and what's not. Yes, uh, quite. I want to talk about three different types of globalization of cuisine that you uh, talk about in the book, uh, British, French, and American. I want to start with British. Uh, the British emphasis on bread and beef to the near exclusion of, of everything else uh, was fascinating. And I think of the, the classic phrase, uh, and I don't know why it's always male, but he's a meat and potatoes man is a um, mm. phrase from my uh, – somewhere in my cultural uh, toolkit. Somehow uh, the idea that British cuisine was uh, attractive spread around – spread around. Uh, it does not have the best reputation today. Uh, how did it become – what what was the – uh, the bread and beef attraction, and what role did the, did the British play in spreading it? Uh, well, beef was supposed to be the strongest of the meats, and uh, bread was supposed to be the strongest of the carbohydrates that you had. Had, And it was widely believed uh, across Europe and the United States, but particularly in Britain, that one of the reasons why the British were able to conquer the world in um, or, or to expand their empire enormously in the particularly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was that they were bread and beef eaters. I mean, you as an economist know there are lots of um, theories about why the British were able to um, conquer so much of the world. The British at the time, of course, had other theories um, that, you know, the British climate made them tough or that um, there was something in, intrinsic to the British character that made them uh, strong. For a lot of other countries, and you find this in Japan and in Latin America in particular, who want to 
develop strong modern nations, the uh, nutritional theory has a lot of appeal because it's very hard to alter the climate of your nation <laughs> and it's very hard to alter the national character of, uh, of the population of your nation. But you can alter uh, the nutrition of your nation. So there was this widespread attempt around the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries uh, to try to convert Mexicans or Argentinians or Brazilians or Japanese to bread and beef diets. Most of those efforts failed because it was economically an incredibly uphill job. But they didn't fail entirely. The Japanese, you know, today eat bread and so do most of the Latin Americans and beef is valued in those places. We live with the results of that. You are what you eat, I guess, is um, is an appealing idea and to some extent true, but maybe not to the extent they used to believe. So we have the, the British having a big influence on world cuisine at the end of the 19th century. Uh, somehow French cuisine becomes the standard of uh, sophistication and high dining. How did that happen? And it still persists to some extent. It's lost some of its cachet, I'd say, in the last – 50 years, but it still right. remains a standard of of high dining. How did that come about and why was it important? Uh, I think it's first important to say we uh, it's French high cuisine because the high cuisine of uh, France that became the international standard was something that most French people had never seen and never mm -hmm. ate. It did not come uh, uh, swell up from the peasantry. Um, there's a slightly complicated story about what happened around 1650 when you get a rapid political change and the establishment of, a, uh, the, after the Peace of Westphalia, a series of nations in Europe on uh, supposedly equal terms, uh, combined with um, a shift uh, of the scientific revolution and uh, the Protestant revolution. And in complicated ways, these will act together to produce a new cuisine that the world had never seen before. It's a, a really striking example of radical and rapid culinary change. The old cuisines of uh, spiced food that, ha that ultimately stemming from Persia, but that really influenced China, um, dominated in India, the high cuisine of India right across to Southern Europe, were displaced by this new Northern European cuisine. And the people who developed it in its most elaborate form, because they had the greatest resources, the courts, the richest courts were the French. And they develop it really terribly rapidly between 1650 and 1700. And that's the point where diplomacy is becoming important because of this national state system. And the national state system needs something to uh, use for diplomatic dinners uh, to demonstrate modernity, Europeanness against the Persian type cuisines that uh, existed before. Um, and so French high cuisine becomes the cuisine of European diplomacy in the 18th century and then of international diplomacy and international, um, the international elite in the 19th century, so that by 1880, you could go to Tokyo, you could go to Santiago de Chile, you could go to uh, Sydney, you could go to San Francisco, and the thing to be eating was, if you were really rich or you were really high in politics, was uh, high French cuisine. And tell the story of what happened in Hawaii, because that's rather remarkable. Oh, yes, it is remarkable. It, it, it's really sad. Um, the uh, Hawaiian islands um, tried to remain independent of the Western powers after they were um, taken over, after they were opened to European influence by Captain Cook in 1788. 
and King Kalakaua went on a world tour in the seven, in the 1880s, and he visited all the heads of state in Japan, in Siam, in um, France, of Queen Victoria, the President of America. Everywhere he went, they had a high French cuisine. That was what he was treated to. And he went back to Hawaii, and he it confirmed him that the policy that the Hawaiian monarchs had been trying, uh, of trying to use the kind of of looking like a uh, European-style monarchy had to be continued. So he built a palace, and he had a coronation dinner that cost really about uh, 20% of the state budget. And he had the misfortune to be doing this when um, there were many uh, powerful Americans in the sugar business and in, uh, as merchants in Hawaii, and they came from a quite different culinary tradition. And I won't say that the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy um, was just because of the building of a palace and the giving of a coronation dinner, but it was kind of symbolic of a big debate going on in the late 19th century between these old monarchical, hierarchic, aristocratic cuisines taken up by international diplomats and the route that America was beginning to sketch out for itself. Talking about French cuisine, I'm reminded of Calvin Trillin's uh, line. He says when you're visiting, a, I think it's talking about a mid-sized American city and or even a large-ish American city and some – and your host says, you know, you'd be surprised for a town of our size. We have a very good French restaurant. He said, uh, they don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, really first-rate French cooking, at least when he wrote his – one of the book I'm thinking of, I think it be in the 70s, I think, maybe the 80s, was limited to a handful of, of large cities in America at least. But it's a statement really, the fact that everyone wanted to have that cachet – of that sophistication of French cuisine, and I guess Julia Childs, to some extent, was the was the high water mark of that in America. Uh, and uh, bouncing off that was Jacques Pepin, who emphasized more of a of a peasant French cooking, right. which which, um, which I always uh, liked more than the than the fancier stuff. But that's partly because I maybe I'm a little bit lazy. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, and you know, there is that distinction. In, in French cuisine. Now, as you point out in the book, an American president who was hosting a foreign delegation would would uh, I think I have this right would serve French the equivalent of a French dinner until fairly recently when it's now become fashionable to have uh, our own native cuisine highlighted more uh, directly. Uh, somewhere along that way, the hamburger uh, became a worldwide force. Uh, partly associated with McDonald's, obviously, and but through a whole set of other forces. So talk about the importance of the hamburger. Well, if I may, I'd like to back up a tiny bit about sure. presidents serving French dinners because the American presidency has had a terrible time uh, deciding what to do with diplomatic dinners from the get-go. Um, there were those who, like Jefferson, who said we've got to be part of the international, uh, of international culture as well as the economy, and we should go with high French cuisine. But there is also this extraordinarily strong Republican with a small R tradition in America. That's, you know, part of what the revolution's about. And rep the uh, Republican strain in American thought said very emphatically that no, we do not want high French cuisine. We do not want aristocratic dining. That is not appropriate. And they looked back to the Roman Republic and to the Dutch Republic and to um, other Republican movements in Europe and said what we need is a decent cuisine for all citizens. And that is the, very much the origin of Thanksgiving, which is not a fancy French dinner for diplomats, 
but a uh, dinner that uh, essentially all Americans can afford and can cook of American ingredients. It's a kind of striking symbol of the Republican tradition in uh, exemplified in an American custom and was deliberately designed to be so. Um, but what happened, I mean, the hamburger is just sort of amazing. People say, well, you know, the British had fish and chips. Well, fish and chips don't cut it because fish and chips are not this beef, bread, um, French fry phenomenon. And what Americans managed to do, beginning with White Tower, but of course pulled off triumphantly by McDonald's, is to make the food of aspiration worldwide something that in America everybody can afford and in much of the rest of the world the middle class can afford, namely a, a kind of ersatz piece of roast beef or steak, that is a hamburger, a beef hamburger on a piece of white bread with a bit of fresh vegetable out of season, even in the winter, with a sauce, which is part of high cuisine, um, with French fries, which, um, you know, are popular, which become really widespread with McDonald's and the frozen French fry, which Simplot perfects. Until then, the French had said it was the, the, uh, the apex of French civilized food and washed down either with a sparkling cold drink or with a milkshake, uh, sweet and rich and cold and foamy. That, I mean, that is just, a, uh, it, it makes the food of aspiration accessible to all. And you have it in this brightly lit dining room that is clean, that uh, you have access to, um, I think only if we understand how McDonald's taps into all these uh, competing traditions that go back so deep in uh, our, our culture can we understand why it became such a kind of fire point for and against about uh, modern American food. Yeah, well, we're going to come back and talk about that in some in some detail, but just to clarify a question that that bitter out of season vegetable is that a tomato? Oh, sorry, a bit. Oh, oh a bit of tomato or a bit of lettuce. Yes, either I one. Mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, either of those. Oh, you're wrong. I think you said. Yeah, I think you said bitter. You meant you said oh, a sorry, bit no, of a, a small piece. Yeah. Yes. Um, as you point out in the book, the I, I think most Americans who don't travel abroad, and when we do, are not so likely to eat at McDonald's. Uh, but most of us, I think, when we think of McDonald's, we think that. The same menu gets transported to other places because people want a McDonald's hamburger and the prices might differ. And, and economists like to sometimes talk about the, the price of McDonald's in different currencies as a form of uh, measuring uh, currency to exchange rates but and, and standards of living. But the, the uh, hamburger that people are eating around the world at, at their McDonald's is not uh, – is very radically different from an American – the American products. Talk about the way McDonald's overseas uh, responds to customer demand. Oh, they're very quick off the mark. Uh, just to mention Hawaii again, because I lived there for a long time. Um, I think it was in the 1950s, as soon as they got to, to Hawaii, they had to introduce rice um, because there's a large Asian population there and they did not want French fries. They wanted rice. That was the prestige thing. And so around the world, um, McDonald's has been um, adjusted to local taste, whether it's the teriyaki burger or the very successful Filipino burger. Um, and it's not just the hamburger has been um, adjusted uh, in terms of its accompaniments and its taste, um, but that the whole experience of dining at McDonald's, which we think of as simply fast food, um, varies with the society. Um, in Mexico, it's a place where well-to-do women can go and have lunch where their children can play safely out of the range of kidnappers. In um, uh, 
China, it, I'm not sure this is still true, but certainly 10 years ago, it was a place to take your children to have a birthday dinner. Um, and in Vietnam, it was a place where a working single woman could go and actually have a meal by herself in a public place without being thought to be a prostitute. That's rather incredible. Uh, the other uh, aspect of world cuisine that, that I learned about from your book that I did not realize was the uh, incredible market uh, effectiveness of ramen, uh, the dried noodles that are then uh, reinvigorated with with boiling water and a little bit of flavor. There was a period of my life where I probably ate them every day uh, yeah. uh, as, a, as for lunch with uh, Parmesan cheese, uh, definitely a, a, a culinary um, – a mixed metaphor, but I uh, went through a long, long time when I ate them a lot. I haven't had them in a while, but I did not realize how popular they were. So talk about that. Well, it, it, and in fact, I mean, this is the kind of uh, lower middling cuisine because it has the same ingredients as the McDonald's hamburger, essentially. What you have is uh, a wheat, wheat flour again. This time it's as a noodle, not as bread. You've got a meaty taste, which is, you know, what everybody wants. And you may have a little few specks of something green floating in the top <laughs> that are supposed to be dried vegetables. Um, but it, it's much more inexpensive than a hamburger. Um, it can be reconstituted uh, very easily. And once it was invented, it was easy to manufacture. So you can, uh, I mean, manufacturing plants sprung up in uh, places like Indonesia and India, which you might expect as well as Japan, but then Nepal, Nepal as a center exporting uh, ramen noodles to India. I mean, that uh, really surprised me when I realized about it, but it has been a huge success. And similarly, it's the, the flavors are often tailored to the local population. Oh, yes, absolutely. I just want to add, I, I would often also add an egg to it, which would talk about convenience. If, if you don't want to spend much time over your meal, uh, bringing water to boil, dropping the noodles in, adding the flavor packet, and then uh, breaking an egg in there until it came, became solid was really easy. And you could convince yourself you were eating something. And it's very tasty, of course. Yes. And actually, you know, that's not bad food. I mean, it's, it's not complete. You probably do need um, – uh, some something green or yellow or orange at some point, but um, you know you've got protein, you've got carbohydrate, you've got fat. But it's well, that's what nothing. The M and M's are at the end. That's that's the green, yellow, and orange. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> the other the other thing about it, I have to just say, is is there, there's something physically beautiful about the shape of the noodles. Um, you know, they look like uh, mattress springs, which is not an image you usually associate with nutrition or food, but there's something aesthetic I always found about the, the way those noodles uh, were, were created. I don't know what, who invented that so that they could be all, you know, uh, coiled up like that, but they can be very beautiful. <laughs> that, that's something nobody has said to me before, but <laughs> I like it. So let's shift gears. Um, this is a good transition. We're talking about uh, McDonald's and ramen, which are uh, very fast foods, whether you're buying them in a restaurant or you're preparing uh, a hamburger or uh, a ramen packet at home. Uh, you have a fascinating essay on what you call culinary modernism. And I want to start by, since we're talking about fast food, talk about the slow food movement and um, how it got started and, and what's, uh, why are you critical of it? Well, um, let's start by saying that often, um, you know, yesterday's uh, successes are today's problems. And what had happened, I think, between, say, the French Revolution and the end of World War II was that the great overriding problem of modern nations how to get a middling cuisine for everybody um, had been basically solved. I mean, not, not completely solved. There were pockets of poverty. There were, uh, you know, inadequate foods and so on and so forth. 
But by the 60s and 70s, people were not dying of typhoid. They were not dying of pellagra in the United States as they had done in their thousands in the 30s. Um, they were well fed. The same was true of Europe once it recovered from World War II. And so the kind of what I am calling the Republican slash democratic uh, culinary modernist philosophy that had dominated um, it for nearly 200 years, I mean, suddenly it all looked easy. Um, and people began instead to take it for granted and begin to perceive problems with it. So people began to say, well, you know, maybe um, there are troubles with large corporations producing food, or maybe there are troubles with animal welfare, or with the environment, or, um, and I don't think this is to be uh, discounted uh, for many people, if everybody is eating a middling cuisine, how do you distinguish yourself? How do you show yourself uh, to be one of the privileged if, you know, everybody can have a hamburger? And so you have, beginning in the 60s and 70s, a series of cookbook authors um, and then uh, organizations. I think Elizabeth David in England as a cookbook author was incredibly influential in this. And, of course, Alice Waters of uh, the famous Chez Panisse in California is a follower of Elizabeth David. Um, you begin to get uh, slow food in uh, Italy reacting against fast food. Um, that's a slightly more complicated situation. But what they're all trying to do is to find some alternative to this small uh, Republican or culinary modernist culinary philosophy that says uh, the, the big, big job is to get a middling cuisine for everybody so that we can have a strong nation. And uh, they turn instead to another of the ideas that was developed in the mid-18th century, when all this was being kicked around, the romantic philosophy of Rousseau, who wrote a lot about food and what kind of food there was. And Rousseau did not take the Republican line at all, nor did he take the other alternative, the socialist or commun communitarian one. He said, if we don't want aristocratic foods, what we've got to do is to look to the foods of, that are close to nature, the foods of of uh, the peasants, uh, imagined peasants, I would say, because uh, the real peasants didn't have these foods. And these were to be uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, milk, um, unprocessed foods. You didn't want to go to state banquets or to restaurants with flunkies who waited on you. You would have the simple food. The ideal food was a meal was not um, a family dinner, well, Thanksgiving, but a picnic in the open air, or if not a picnic, a meal with fresh and foraged foods that came directly uh, from either tiny farmers or from the forest. And uh, this becomes by... Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, an enormously appealing idea because it fits in with the environmentalist ethic. Um, it fits in with the idea that uh, uh, we have gone too far with industrialization, uh, the corporate world, all those kinds of uh, big enterprises that seem to be unmanageable and threatening. And so this becomes uh, very rapidly in the early 21st century the dominant culinary philosophy of those who care about food. Fresh, natural, organic, uh, slow. Local. Local. Unprocessed, et cetera, et cetera. Unprocessed. They forget. I mean, processing just gets... Uh, um, kind of written out of the, the the agenda. And that sounds nice. I mean, I'm I'm not. Um, my listeners know I'm. I have a strong tendency to push back against what I consider romanticism. But one person's romanticism is another person's deep truth. Um, so on the surface, 
it seems like a good thing. What's wrong with natural, local, unprocessed, close to the earth? And I, and I should add, there's, and you might talk about in the book, there's a certain Garden of Eden uh, aspect of this as well. It taps into another cultural uh, ideal that we have. There's something idyllic about the way we imagine uh, peasants or simpler folk ate, and there's something romantic about going back to that. Yes. And there's also a sense of self-fulfillment and closeness to nature that you feel reunified with something bigger. Um, I think that said, of the, course, that said, of course, by someone who's never um, killed a chicken, uh, <laughs> right? But of course, some there's also a strong movement toward vegetarianism, which avoids that problem. Um, yes. But, yes. But sorry, I interrupted. Oh well, I, I think uh, the problem is that. Uh, the appeal is very obvious. And I'd say the problem is two-pronged. The, the fundamental problem, I think, is that the, 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 the people who subscribe to this view um, have not worked out uh, the economics and the technology of how you can, uh, and I know people hate the word, phrase feed the world, but feed the world uh, with uh, this kind of food unless you have a massive return to uh, small-scale agriculture and to laborious processing, uh, which there doesn't seem to be a huge rush to do. There is some move to small-scale farming, but there's no sign at the moment that it can be scaled up to produce uh, food in the quantity that the big uh, Midwestern and Californian farms can produce. And so what happened is that there have been a series of attempts to um, give some particularity to this. Um, we want to do organic. Well, then it turns out that organic is a little more complicated because it still involves pesticides. They're just natural pesticides that, uh, that organic does not produce safer or tastier food and it has lower yields. So, okay, sort of the organic uh, is um, uh, put to one side slightly and we change to local. And local, supporting your local economy sounds wonderful until you work out, well, if you're supporting your local economy, you're not supporting the one down the road. And that uh, when you count in um, the effect of uh, modern you, you, transport. You faded out there for a second. You, when you count in what? The efficiencies of modern transport, container-style transport and uh, railroads and uh, uh, container ships, um, it can, in fact, be very possible to take advantage of the uh, comparative advantage of the climate in New Zealand to have New Zealand lamb sold in United States and Europe. And then you go from organic and local and you try uh, slow or you try some other um, uh, effort. But And each one comes accompanied with a scare. And I think people are becoming a little weary of uh, the successive scares of the food movement. That's just a sense I've had in the last six months partly as a result of the uh, reaction to the reprinting of this article I did. When it first came out, it had no reaction at all. When it was reprinted in, I think, uh, 2010 in the New York Times and Utney Reader, there was an incredibly hostile reaction. Yes, there would have been. <laughs> and now, although there are plenty of hostile comments, um, there is a much greater interest in um, thinking about alternatives to the romantic vision um, that come to terms with the fact that we have achieved abundance and we need to move on to new kinds of problems. So the other criticism you make, though, is that it's not – we can debate 
people, reasonable people can disagree about whether local cuisine can be scaled up or organic, can, you know, can be successful, whether organic can be scaled up, whether uh, unprocessed foods are attractive enough to people under whatever you mean by unprocessed, because as you point out, every food is processed almost in some some fashion. But the other point you make, which I found fascinating, is that this romantic vision of the past is inaccurate, uh, that that this idea that peasants ate quote, healthier food than we do, that slow food um, is somehow, uh, an, an, when it's truly uh, accurate, is, is, is appealing. In fact, it's not. It's, you know, it's the equivalent of saying, I want to be self-sufficient, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my own roof. But are you going to make your own hammer? Uh, no, you're going to buy a hammer. You're going to cheat. So you're really not self-sufficient because self-sufficiency is the road to poverty. So, exactly. So I, what I, what I'd like you to talk about why uh, dishonoring or being inaccurate about the history is important. For just the reasons I think that you have said, uh, that uh, if we uh, – I think it has repercussions at all kinds of levels. Uh, if we say – that uh, peasants in the past ate self uh, healthier and safer food, um, it's easy to translate that into uh, the world of development and say, we really want people to stay in small farms on the land. We want uh, women in South Africa to continue pounding uh, their maize in a mortar with a great big pestle um, and to condemn them to the kind of poverty that our ancestors, ancestors escaped, you know, uh, three, four, five, six generations ago. Um, I think we just simply have to give up uh, the myth of a golden age in the past that is a template for the present. Of course, I have no problem, and I assume you don't either, with people who choose to eat that way. Or, no, no, no. Our choice is, you know, that, that all is the more choice, the better. But what you're concerned about is people who want to choose for me. Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the whole of that sentence. Uh, I, I assume you're more concerned about people who want to choose for me and decide what that I should eat. If I don't want to eat slow, slow food, that I that I have to. If I want to import my food, no, I should eat local. You're worried about folks who are imposing their preferences on others. Yes, and I think that's really important because I think another thing that we really need to take into account is that through most of history, most people have had almost no choice in what they ate at all. Um, and that was partly a matter of scarcity, but it was partly a matter also of these hierarchical cuisines because the church and or the state or the local land owner, owner um, determined what you ate with religious rules, with uh, sumptuary laws, um, with access to foodstuffs. There were multiple ways in which uh, what most people ate was totally prescribed and uh, where their choice in what they had was uh, n essentially nil. We are now so used to choice, and it's not just the choice of whether we will have beef or chicken or lamb or pork. We choose whether we will have ch Chinese or French or Italian. Um, we choose whether uh, we might have tonight just popcorn and a glass of wine, and tomorrow night we might go out to a fancy restaurant. We have choice among dozens of different uh, vectors of our food. And that's something that is very recent. I, I'm a historian. Very recent means for me the last two or three generations in human history. And the point I, that you make, uh, one of the, the historical um, observations that you, you're able to make in your, in your essay is that a lot of what we call ethnic food or traditional food that we use to express our Connection with ethnic uh, uh, tradition, say, or national heritage or whatever it might be, 
are often not uh, particularly ethnic and not particularly traditional. There's a long list here. I, I don't know if you remember them all, but I, I, I'm going to read a couple. Um, you say for every prize dish that goes back 2,000 years, a dozen have been invented in the last 200. The French baguette, a 20th century phenomenon adapted nationwide only after World War II. English fish and chips dates from the late 19th century when the working class took up the fried fish of Sephardic Jewish immigrants in East London. Uh, it's a balti and lager now, balti being a kind of stir-fried curry dreamed up by Pakistanis living in Birmingham. Greek moussaka created in the early 20th century in an attempt to Frenchify Greek food. Uh, tequila promoted as the national drink of Mexico during the 1930s by the Mexican film industry. Uh, it go on and on. It's um, really uh, – including uh, – the, the the lomi lomi salmon of Hawaii, which of course you point out, there are no ho salmon near Hawaii. No, <laughs> no, it, it, it's sort of one of my favorite sports. Checking out one more uh, supposedly ancient national dish <laughs> that was invented <laughs> within the last thirty, fifty, a hundred years. And that's true about tequila. Oh, yes. And um, for the well-to-do in Mexico, um, tequila has only become an ex acceptable drink in the last generation. It was really rough stuff that only the very poor drank. So as you point out, uh, this, this, these issues about um, modern food, uh, industrialization, and, and of course, you know, I'm – I see that, like you, I think to some extent, I see the current uh, availability of inexpensive first-rate food to be one of the great triumphs of human creativity and inge ingenuity, not a tragedy. Um, the, the ability for people around the world to eat well in, in unimaginable ways that they couldn't have done 50 and 100 years ago is, I think, just something to be wildly celebrated. But I, I, as you as you suggested when you first published this, and even recently, you've gotten a lot of criticism. Uh, what what are some of those criticisms, and uh, what what have your uh, what's been your response and your and what's the personal part of it for you and in, in being, I suppose, something of a pariah. You're, you're a, a food historian, and yet uh, you're probably vilified by some some fairly eminent food experts. Uh, I'm too small a minnow for that. So. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, you quickly learn, uh, and I'm sure this is not new, you do not read the comment section on <laughs> any. <laughs> Though when you glance at them, they tend to, uh, it's rare, I find, for serious commentary to come up there. Um, it, it tends to be of the kind that you are ignorant uh, or more likely immoral. Your pawn, um, of, your pawn it, of corporate America, I'm sure, is a yes, common. Yes, I, I, I've escaped to a surprisingly large extent. Uh, I was out of the country for much of the time. Um, as I say, uh, I, uh, you know, I have labored away. Sort of, uh, I wrote that article when I was beginning on this book. And uh, so I was working on the book. I was not engaging in debate for much of the decade. Um, among the people who do food history, um, I've been happy to find that, you know, I have a, a, a reasonable reputation and people will listen to me. And as I said, this latest round that began quite recently that there's a real change in mood, I think, at the moment, and people are actually interested in in getting a different perspective. Um, I, 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 I mean, it's clear that you know the modern uh, the modern food system. I think, like you do, it's a great creative triumph. It is one of uh, the most. Uh, uh, amazing things that humans have been able to pull off and that's not just a matter of farming I really wanted to put processing right at the center of it because it's just as important as the farming and people tend to forget that which is why you know I tend not to talk about farming I think that's another reason why I have not had a great deal of criticism most 
because most of the food movement is uh, is concerned with the fresh and the natural, they just dismiss food processing as not really worth uh, taking seriously. We want to get rid of complex food processing. And so they just spend most of their time trying to talk about alternatives to the modern farming system, small farms, organic farms, and so on, rather than talking about alternatives to modern processing. So I have slipped by on that front. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, a new era of debate will emerge because... um, You know, there are questions to be asked about, still about uh, what are, now that we have abundance, all these uh, ways of thinking about food were all really designed to deal with scarcity. And we do have abundance and hopefully um, if the world population levels off, um, and farming continues to improve, we will continue to have abundance. And uh, that brings with it new questions of human choice, of human dignity, of uh, different kinds of diseases, and all those have to be addressed. I just want to add a footnote, and you can agree or disagree, um, to what I had said earlier, which is while I am highly skeptical of much of the so-called food movement that you've been talking about. I do think that we have privileged some corporate players in ways that are really bad. Uh, The the subsidies in the United States system, and of course they exist in many, many countries around the world that that privilege farmers and increase their profits, uh, that favor, say, corn producers through ethanol subsidies, et cetera, that is that overlays the human creativity that that um, that I praised earlier, and I do think there's plenty of room for improvement there. I couldn't agree more about that, um, and uh, not just in the farming section, but in the processing section. And I think the food movement has also done an incredibly good job of. Uh, moving people beyond the point where they are just so happy to be able to have, um, you know, food readily available in packets to open Mm -hmm. and to uh, talk about uh, what might be more healthful and more tasty and perhaps more environmentally sustainable food. I mean, I think that has been a tremendous contribution. So... I want to close uh, and try to turn the tables on you. So uh, be prepared. You, um, (laughs) sorry, it sounded ominous. It's not really ominous. Um, You uh, write that you grew up, and you mentioned earlier that you grew up on a farm. And I wondered if there's any uh, romance in in Rachel Loudon. So obviously, uh, Proust is the most obvious example of someone who uses food to evoke childhood emotion and we, you know we haven't talked much about the emotional side of it we talk about the cultural side but obviously we as as adults look back on certain experiences of our youth that that are inextricably bound up with food our family gatherings are inextricably bound up with food uh i think even of you know rat, to go from Proust to ratatouille the the movie uh that movie centers around a childhood uh, longing for certain uh, certain food food experiences. Do you have any um, special foods or processes or experiences that, from your youth, in a very um, uh, atypical way for most people growing up on a farm? Farms are incredibly scarce now in America. Uh, most Americans have zero uh, experience of of farming and of what it takes to get, as I said, to say to slaughter a chicken or to even to get wheat into the into the um, position where it can be processed. Does your childhood have any echoes in your adult life, things that you still uh, romanticize? Whether I romanticize them, I mean, I do think I can understand the appeal. I mean, I had a 
green gauge tree. That's the best of all plums, espaliered on the wall outside my bedroom. And there is nothing that tastes better than a warm green gauge plucked out of your bedroom window on a, on a summer evening. And I did have the extraordinary good fortune to grow up eating uh, what I think, uh, you know, the romantic movement uh, dreams of. Um, we had milk fresh from the cow. I never had pasteurized milk until I went to school. Uh, we had fish from the river, pheasant from the farm. Um, the food was extremely good. The Fren French friends used to come and stay for great long periods of time um, because they liked it so much. It wasn't fancy, but it was, you know, all, we never had cans, we never had tins, we never, everything was fresh from the garden. So I do romanticize some of that because the taste was often um, extraordinary. And then I tweak myself and I say, look, Rachel, your mother spent all day, every day, gardening or cooking, essentially, as well as doing other chores. And she said to you, Rachel, it's servitude. Um, I want you to have a life I didn't have. And here I am sitting in this very privileged position of having had a life as an academic, which has to be one of the uh, you know, happier situations a human being can find themselves in with time to think and you know, uh, money to live on and the chance to travel. So yes, there's the romanticism. Uh, yes, it does help me understand the appeal. Yes, I shall probably never eat anything as good as that green gauge again. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I uh, have had choices in life that that didn't allow for. And we were, uh, you know, well-to-do farmers. Not everybody farming had that kind of choice. My guest today has been Rachel Loudon. She is the author of Cuisine and Empire. Rachel, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. It was a pleasure. Thanks very much, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.